the lecture slides. So do you think uh, these ads are fair? Are they, well, actually, not me asking. What, what are your immediate uh, reactions, your thoughts on these ads? I mean, I feel like they're definitely not looking at the big problem that's right in front of them. What's they're the using it, the hysteria, pushing agenda. Yeah. I mean, but don't you know the coronavirus, to quote Cardi B, it's real. It's going to kill all of us, millions of us, if we leave our houses. Whose fault is it? Uh, I feel like the ad for Biden, he's capitalizing on, like, this is great timing for him since all the allegations came out. He gets to put blame on Trump and, you know, push blame away from himself for any of his actions. So, yeah, it's important to note, like, so I should, that's what I should have showed. There's a uh, article that came out from one of the uh, advertising companies uh, that Biden and Sanders have not aired any ads in almost a month. So like ever since this whole coronavirus thing, actually, yeah, since so since right before spring break, we haven't heard a peep, a hide nor a hair out of any of them. And so the only ads that we do see are from PACs and super PACs. And then even in all of this, you've noticed there has not been like, I haven't, I've been like trolling the internet for a while. I haven't seen a pro Bernie super PAC discuss the coronavirus. I've only seen pro Biden or anti-Trump. So of course these are like two different factions, pro-Biden or anti-Trump. Did you see um, Bernie did like a mini press conference about coronavirus? I heard about the first one like a week or two ago that was like yeah. a struggle like in his basement. Well, he was talking about how this was kind of like an example of what he wants, like how Trump is getting um, healthcare uh, insurance companies to just give like free treatment to people with coronavirus um, and he's like this is what the country needs this is what I want this is what I'm campaigning for and wait this is what Biden said no Bernie oh Bernie no I have not heard anything I haven't heard about this one I, I've heard about the Biden but I haven't heard about Bernie's yeah he just talked about how like this free health care situation that we have right now with um, insurance companies giving free treatment to coronavirus patients is like he's trying to capitalize on saying like this is what I'm campaigning for and nothing else okay yep. do you think in the long run oh, I can open up to everybody like perhaps this coronavirus will actually hurt Bernie's chances of securing the nomination yeah I mean like Cuomo is polling better than him right now, and Cuomo's not running. It's late in the game for anybody to just introduce themselves now. Like we've already had Super Tuesday. It's Bloomberg old is and they can die. I mean, Andrew, like his little brother has the coronavirus. Yeah, I think if we get to the convention, if they get to the convention without a nominee, Cuomo could easily get delegates in like the second or third round there isn't going to be a convention coronavirus yeah but like a uh, zoom convention they could do it do you see how <laughs> difficult this is right now with what there's five of us on camera and you away and we can't talk at the same time it's not happening I'm like no 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 and then besides it could be hacked i've heard about uh other there's like some trolls that have been hacking some professors' uh, Zoom classes. So no, no, no. Could you imagine? Trolls could like hack the Zoom RNC or DNC. It would be a hot mess. No. There's no Olympics. There's no DNC. There's no RNC. We're just going to have a crappy summer. It's just, just do. There's no graduations. There are no anime conventions. No barbecues. We're all just going to be in the house until Labor Day. It is what it is. And theoretically, OU's Instagram, they're promising a commencement eventually. They just don't know when it's going to be. 
if they have a, if they have graduation, I will uh, go on and purchase my what's it call it my uh, OSU nice. garb so I can like watch the babies cross the stage. Like I would do that if they have a graduation. So I'll go on and buy it. Actually, that's what I could do with my stimulus check. I've already spent the check like a million different ways now. It's all just reckless. But all right, let's get into what we're supposed to be doing, talking about public opinion in the media, which is why I started with the uh, ads. I want to say for the most part, last time I checked ABC, even though ABC's polling is mad sketch, uh, that it was it was pushing almost 60%. ABC News said that uh, six, almost 60% of their viewers gave favorable uh, support for Trump's response to coronavirus, thought he was doing a good job. It's like, how can that be? Okay, anyways, but back into what I wanted you all to do at the end of Tuesday. Did y'all do it? Did you think about the first time you thought about politics? Was it like a couple of years ago when you were still young and hopeful during recess? All of that. I think I ended class. I told the story about when I first started thinking about politics. And I actually had found a video from that time because apparently once upon a time, Nickelodeon, you know, the channel, Sam, Carly, SpongeBob, all that great stuff. Did you know that they used to be really politically active? Used to tell kids all about politics, all that stuff. So I found a commercial from then. So I wanted to play what it was like back then. Changing things around. All right. So, no, actually, no, that's not the right one. Where's kids pick the president? There we go. All right. All right. Yeah. Someone said, yeah, like, uh, <laughs> begrudgingly. Like, was it a dark time in Nickelodeon? Like, I thought it was pretty cool. I used to watch Nick News and everything. And I'm not that old. So... <laughs> said it was a horrible time no that was a dark time in my childhood that was a lovely I consider it to be a lovely time I, know, I, I, I avoided most of those shows I so, wasn't alive I was, I was still little though so it's like so what did you think about like that type of poll like do you think it was accurate do you think it was appropriate to ask children those types of questions it i don't think that it was aimed towards children because it, it there's obviously the adults that are watching with them so i feel like it would be aimed at the adults that are watching with them yeah that it was so all of the pollsters that were asking these little children and all these results, like this, this was targeted towards 21 and above, as opposed to the actual seven and eight year olds watching at that time, the Rugrats and perhaps maybe the wild thornberries. And not. I mean, I'd say so. Look at the crude humor that was in those cartoons that completely went over our heads. Yeah. I, I, I did. I have. Point. I have rewatched Rocco's Martin Life since I've been home, and I will say that I like. Yeah, that had no business being on the air back in the day, like that. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless of that, cat dog. I, I enjoy cat dog. Cat dog. I would still let my little cousins watch. Now. So did I. But all the crude humor that was in it. Yeah, like all, all the shows have the underlying humor that the kids aren't going to understand. But in addition to the crude humor, they were asking political questions. I mean, you don't think it's relevant now to go down to the elementary school or to the middle school and ask the students what they think about gun control? Middle school maybe, but I don't know as much elementary school. They, ha they have the, uh, the drills now. I heard word on the street is they make them do the uh, active shooter drills. If we have to have them practice the drills, shouldn't their uh, opinions on these issues matter? Yeah, kind of, maybe. Maybe. Gun control is more of a like topic that kids know about <laughs> nowadays compared to back then. Like, there's just it's more in unfortunately like in an elementary school kids' mind now than it used to be. Could we consider that, sadly, or 
happily or sadly being the first political uh, thought kids have nowadays? Probably, yeah. So who wants to just give a brief... How old was one of you the first time you thought about politics? I was like eight, I think. It was like fourth grade. And it was the 2008 election. I remember thinking about it. Fourth grade? And, yep. We, we, in my school, we actually did a poll between uh, Obama and McCain when I was in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Yep. We had a fake, like, election set up. Fourth and fifth grade, huh? Bro, y'all were mm -hmm. in fifth grade in 2008? I think I was in second grade. Wait. I'm, I'm old. I mean, I'm um, so I wasn't sure. born in 2001. I I was a college freshman. <laughs> uh, that's why I'm just sitting here like <laughs> you bunch of babies. <laughs> uh, eventually, I'm, I think I'm gonna like stop this exercise after a while because like y'all are like. Great. I mean, I, I was born in '97. I'm almost 23. <laughs> y'all are like make me feel old. Ah! All right. Well, now that I know that all y'all were a bunch of babies, except for Zach, he was a little bit older. So, like, that makes me feel a little bit better. But y'all, <laughs> fourth and fifth grade. Zach, are you a junior or a senior? I'm a senior. <laughs> and then what? One of you were in the second grade. Oh my god. Oh, uh, first grade. <laughs> first grade? Someone was in the first. Oh god. Danny, just let's just let's just talk about coming no. of political age. Cause... Oh, interesting. All right, so let's talk about this political socialization. <laughs> so all political socialization is is just the way in which society transmits political orientations from generation to generation. So that's Perloff's definition. You can also look at it as the way in which we all come to learn about politics as well as develop our political opinions. And throughout this whole process, there is change and continuity throughout it. And so within this whole process, there are socialization agents and all these agents are, they're not like agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or whatever, like with glasses and all that, no. They're just sources of political learning, political experiences, opinions. These are just phenomenon that uh, foster learning as well as development of your opinions. And so these include your family, your friends, the school, the media, news sources, entertainment so uh, sources, political events. Uh, let's see, there is a whole subfield within uh, the study of political behavior that looks at the roles of political socialization. I was also like, that was going to be like my original research track, but studying political socialization takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And of course I'm here at OWU and so we don't have time for like to study, I don't have yeah, the time or the funding to actually study political socialization the way it should be studied, but there is a branch uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, Sears and Valentino, they study it. Uh, basically, you develop like the opinions that you have right around the time, like in college age now, right until about 23, 24, the opinions that you have, that's it. They crystallize at about 20, somewhere between 23 and 25. That's it. And so those attitudes that you're developing now, right until shortly after you graduate from college, those will be the attitudes that you'll have for the rest of your life. So what happens after that is that they will crystallize and that they will become more intense. So the whole stereotype of the bleeding left hippie as a young person that turns into the crotchety conservative person when they're old, that doesn't happen. All that happens is the bleeding left-leaning hippie that's young will just moderate slightly, but they will still be left-leaning. They never go completely from left all the way to right. We don't ever see changes like that. If you identify as a liberal, you'll continue to be a liberal forever. If you identify as not a Democrat, that you'll stay a Democrat forever because party, party, party stances can change. And of course, you know, what each party stands for can change over time. However, your attitudes and stuff will just moderate some. So, and there are also generational differences. 
uh, in terms of expressions of and belief in certain in certain issues too. And we can talk about that too. So in getting into all this generation stuff, so like it's weird because there's still not clear consensus, but this is what the Pew, the Pew Research Center officially delineates every group. So of course, I'm a millennial all the way up through 1994. So now they are, they're turning 26 and the eldest of us are turning 40, my God. And then all of you were a bunch of babies, all y'all are Gen Z. And then if you have any siblings or any small cousins, they're Gen Alpha, so, which is kind of weird, but why are, you know, y'all are Z and then they turn to Alpha, then I guess what, Beta, and then what comes after Beta? It's not Gamma, it's something else, right? I, I, don't, I don't know the Greek alphabet anymore, but yes, y'all are Gen Z. Uh, huh? Well, that, that's what comes after, uh, after Beta? Tau, tau? Really? Huh. Well, Charlie. So all the way through 2025, if we make it that far, that'll be all through Gen Alpha. And so with that in mind, make sure we can all see this. So Perloff argues that there are important cataclysmic events that define each generation. And so for the silent generation, those were individuals born between 1925 and 45. So like that includes like my grandparents, that the most important events for them were the moon landing, Vietnam War, JFK's assassination, World War II and 9-11. For the baby boomers, so some of our parents and some of our grandparents, depending, uh, the moon landing, Obama's election, the Vietnam War, JFK's assassination, 9-11. For some of our older relatives or some parents, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the tech revolution, the war in the Middle East in 9-11, and then Perloff argues that for my generation, it's 9-11, the Obama election, the Iran and Afghanistan wars, gay marriage, and the tech revolution. Is, what is you... this a slide? Is all I see is YouTube. Yeah. Oh, you can't see them all? No, all I see is the YouTube well, page that you had up. Wait, so nobody's talking? Oh. So I have just been, oh, okay. Well, thanks, Zach. I was yeah. wondering what. Yeah, I was wondering what's going on. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> I hate you just, uh... all right. So had all these slides. So, 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 so now we see this. There was a whole now slide I was it. talking about political. So, so y'all see this now? Yeah. Okay, so we got this. I was talking about this. Okay. And then I was talking about this with all the birth dates and ages. Now we see this, all right. And then I, this is what I was talking about. Okay. <laughs> I hate all this. I just, ugh. Okay, so yeah, these were the events that Perloff argues are like the cataclysmic, most important events that define a generation, each generation. So for, I said before, the silent generation between 1925 and 19, what did I say the years were for the silent ones? 25 to 45. These were the events that defined their lives uh, for baby boomers that are what? 46 through 64. These are the events for Gen X, 9-11, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the tech revolution, et cetera. These are the events that define them. And then for my generation, Perloff argues it's 9-11, the Obama election, the war in the Middle East, gay marriage, and then the tech revolution. And so I was asking, now that you see these are the events he argues defines, defines each generation, what did you think? Do you think they're valid? Do you think there are perhaps better events or alternate events that perhaps define each generation? I mean, because, like, yeah, I, I totally disagree with the millennials. Like, I. Yeah, that's fair. Huh? But yeah, the millennial one's fair. Don't know. Yeah. I don't know about, like, Obama's election for baby boomers. 
You don't buy it, Danny? I would. It's the first black president we've ever had. Yeah. But it doesn't mean anything for the silent generation? Well, no, but they were the big conversion area between the 60s and 70s. Extreme. Yeah. They were the progress towards um, not equal rights and stuff, but they were the ones that like really brought that into society, not just into the legal sector, but into society itself. And so Obama's election was just like the culmination of all of that. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean anything for the silent generation. <laughs> the yeah, moon landing I mattered. Like, like, we only got Obama because Bush was like such a disaster. Really? I don't think Obama would have been elected had Bush not come directly before him. So if we had, what, Kerry in 04, that Obama would have never happened? Yeah. But that's just how elections work. Usually it alternates between Republicans and Democrats. Well, not even just the party. Like, it would have taken a little bit. Like, but I think, and I've talked to a lot of people who agree with me, like, Bush was so bad that we got a little extra besides a democratic president and that that's not a good way to word it but like i mean so then what are your predictions for the fall then i think i mean i think trump's gonna win um unless he really 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 fucked up I'm not convinced an election's going to happen this fall. We're going to be under martial law, but that's that's a conversation for uh, conspiracy alley. We're t- I'm teaching. Eventually, one of these days, I'm going to like set aside Regardless. time. We're going to make tinfoil hats. It's going to be fun. No, we're not. But um, <laughs> you know, you have to get ready. <laughs> huh? Regardless, the- after the election date, Trump is still going to be. Whether there's an election or not. That's true, what true. I think. And so while we're talking about all these For events. Or against it. So like, as I said, like, actually, I don't agree with Perloff. But I was like, really? The tech revolution matters? Okay. So like, I argue that there's still maybe one more event that's uh, for millennials that hasn't happened yet that defines the millennial generation. That I argue that, in fact, okay, yeah, the technology revolution, yeah. Like, when I was growing up, we didn't have internet. Now we have internet. Like, I went through tape players, CD players, MP, and now MP3, and now we're just streaming stuff. So, like, VHS all the way through streaming now. Like, I found out, like, they're now streaming Sonic the Hedgehog, and they're going to release, what, those other two uh, Disney movies now? Like, I'm very excited so hooray for the inter- like technology. 9-11 matters, yes. I think Obama's election as well as the Great Recession matters, yes. I think Trump's election also matters too. So like, so that whole period, what, between 08 and today? Yeah. And then, I don't know, if we need a fifth one, I'd be willing to say coronavirus. Like, we've, I, like I've never went through a global pandemic before. That's our, that's our. Oh, 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 this is Gen Z's? All right. All right. You, so, had your, you had your disaster. We, what, what, is, what is the millennial this disaster? Is, is it the Great Recession? That's uh, ours? 9/11. We're headed into another one. Oh, 9 oh, 11. We also have a Great Recession. Oh, that's, that's right, because there's a decent number of you that were born after 9 11, so you can't claim 9 uh, 11. Not afterwards, but I was born briefly I before. I was old enough to be like four yeah. or five. I was there. All right, so you all tell me what is what are the events that define you all? Since apparently only two of you were alive when 9-11 happened. I mean the I think the social media like explosion. So and that's different from the technology revolution. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
I'd say social media, um, not Obama's election because that we weren't, yes, we were aware of it, but because of like, I don't know, that wasn't all that like dramatic for us. Um, Trump's, okay, Trump's election definitely Iraq, maybe, because at least for my area, a lot of the kids that I went to high school with decided to enlist in the military because of it. So we said social media um, explosion, war in the Middle East. Can y'all see me doing this? Yeah. All right. I don't know yeah. about, like, the war in the Middle East, though, because, like, I mean, I I know that applies to where Max lives, but, like... Before going to, like, I don't know anybody who's ever enlisted in the army just because of, like, where I'm from. And it hasn't impacted anybody that I know. Okay, then maybe not. So, I mean, there's still three events. I think definitely Corona, just because of yeah. how big it is. So, yeah. y'all are going to claim coronavirus. Also, Trump's election. Got to put a school shooting in there, too. Trump's election and school. I mean, we, we, we had school shootings. We had the yeah, original. We had Columbine. Like, we started it all. Like, I know that's not something to brag about. <laughs> <laughs> we started it. No. <laughs> I know that's real that's, dark, right? <laughs> that's our thing. We were first. <laughs> school shootings or... Increase. Oh, Stoneman Douglas. Andy Hood. What about the boom in artificial intelligence and stuff? Are you talking about the rise of Alexa in Siri? No, the there rise of Alexa. But no, the boom in artificial intelligence and predictive programming and stuff like that, like machine learning. So, like Zuckerman and all of those people, like selling our data. That's what y'all are talking about, like that stuff. Like Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg for one, but no. Not Zuckerberg the robot. So we have one nomination for school shootings. We have one for what was it? Uh machine Take out the learning. War in the Middle East. <laughs> so no more war in the Middle East. Yeah. I'm still unclear by this machine learning. I feel like gay marriage was big. So we have one for gay marriage. So. But not expansion of LGBTQ rights. Has, have they been expanded beyond marriage? I mean, when the like gay marriage stuff happened, like, I don't know about everybody else, but like, I was like, were you like six? I was 13. So I was just not thinking about yeah. that. Like, yeah, I was sad. when it happened, I, I wasn't focused on that at all. It was just kind of a background thing in my life. I was at summer camp and it happened and my counselor was just like, oh, gay marriage is legal. And everybody was like, okay. But maybe rephrase it as like LGBTQ acceptance. LGBTQ acceptance. Like if that makes sense. Yeah. Reproductive rights? There's been a whole... Re there are reproductive rights now? I feel like that's sliding. <laughs> oh, yeah, especially where I well, am. Well, that's what I mean. here to reproductive rights. Fight for reproductive rights. Wait, are you saying, like, decrease in reproductive rights? Oh, absolutely. No. Shout out to... The, the fight to keep... Leave it. That this is uh, also, okay, fight to keep reproductive rights. I can't spell. All right. So which one of these is like deserves the number two spot? Of course, this doesn't mean anything, you know, in order. It's just to be considered one of the five. 
So we have social media explosion. I mean, like, well, TikTok. <laughs> if I see another damn TikTok dance video or the damn makeup video, you know what they where they pass the brush. I have watched like six of them today. I'm tired of it because, like, I don't understand how they work. Like, do you? Does everybody know each other? Like, okay. And then, like, apparently. Courtney Kardashian's son is on there and is now beefing with some makeup dude. Like I've 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 read this today. Like the little ten year old boy said something about what's the guy's name Jeffrey Star, and then <laughs> Jeffrey Star like went on live and talked bad about the ten year old <laughs> and Kylie Jenner. It, it, it is like why do I know this because it's on Buzzfeed, but like this is TikTok, huh? I, I, I'm judging y'all. Because that's y'all's social that, media that, explosion. I mean, that's not solely what TikTok is. You say that's all it is? Just dances and passing it's the all, brush? No. That's not solely what it is. It's all based on your consumption algorithm, where which comes in AI. So this is like you're going back to this is why machine learning is important? It's also what Chris yeah. likes ads are too. Yeah, it's an algorithm. Okay, so AI has literally. So then, what are you saying? It should be more than five? No, I feel like it's gonna affect. So let's see. We can. The general. I don't know, y'all. Y'all. The generation coming. below us is gonna grow up. That's why our tech boom wasn't that big. We grew up with it. The generations below us are going to grow up with AI. We are where it changed. And it's just like, yeah, we had videotapes. Do you even know what a videotape is? Yeah, I still have a VHS player with some of the old Black Diamond Disney movies. We still have a VHS player. Do you have videotapes? I think we have three of them. Yeah, I had that orange. Yes, I, I actually have the camera, the big ass camera that takes the videotape. Yeah, all our home videos you mean are on the paperweights. Yeah. <laughs> well, really? Well, I mean, so that means you understand, like, have you ever used a floppy disk? Do you know what an actual floppy disk is? Some of my old games from my on my Windows 98 computer use floppy disks. That's the only reason I have a Windows 98 computer. The only that's, thing that plays them. Oh, that's gross. You, oh, wow. You should save that. That's gonna like become a relic in a museum soon. Like, wow. All right. Well, <laughs> let's move onward in the slides. Let me change the share so that way it does it properly. Ah, uh, well, no. Let's see. Should it be this way? Will it continue? All this stuff is like weird. <sighs> and of course, if you don't see anything, you'll let me know. Current slide. All right. Can we now see the presentation or no? Yep. All right, cool. It's back. Yeah. All right. So more about media and socialization, political socialization. Move this out the way. Okay. So, of course, politics is becoming inseparable from popular culture. Uh, this time last year when I was teaching the class, I was talking about shows like House of Cards, The Daily Show, and apparently, I still haven't watched Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but apparently Brooklyn Nine-Nine does a lot of political satire. But I do, I was aware of like House of Cards before, you know, we found out Kevin Spacey was, is, not was, is a predator, and you know, that just like shut everything down. So like, that's why House of Cards was pulled. It's a shame, because I heard it was a great show, and I oh, could use it in my teaching, but they've pulled it. Just, that show was incredible for four seasons, and then they ended Kevin Spacey, and the fifth season is like a comedy for some reason. I thought Netflix pulled it. No, they finished. They just like all of a sudden, like they started the show with an episode where it's just like, yeah, he died, and they didn't explain it at all. Like they just killed him off screen. I mean, isn't that what they did to, like, the Roseanne show? Like, they made her OD on, like, drugs. And then, like, they just made the show about the rest of them. Well, 
I, and I, I don't even think it's called the Roseanne show anymore. It's called something else. But anyways, Farmers, I think. Anyway, so the show, you know, and anyways, about the show. But as a result of the ways in which uh, politics is becoming sep uh, inseparable from pop culture, we have this experience called hyper reality. And all hyper reality is, it's just like this postmodern sense of the real that accounts for our loose. Uh, our loss of certainty and being able to distinguish between various modes of representation. So like it emphasizes the ways in which like the traditional distinctions between news and entertainment, fake news and real news, fact and fiction have become blurred. It's that, is this life feeling? Or is like, are we really talking about this? So like, it's the fact that, you know, we're I'm teaching you through Zoom and I hate Zoom and this is all awkward and we're, we're not in University Hall 220. Like, this is a thing. Like, we're in a pandemic. In a global pandemic. And there's a third of the class. And there's a what? A third of the class. Oh, there is way less Maybe than a quarter. That. This one does kind of suck. Like, but it's like, th this is, it's this. Martial law could be happening. People are making toilet paper deals. They're slinging toilet paper. Like, right. This is hype, yeah, this, my students, <laughs> this hyper reality. <laughs> I heard we can only have like five people on our Zoom call or something like that because Owu didn't spring for the package. Oh, oh, I actually, uh, I used Owu's card. I bought it. Okay, because I was going to say that's one thing to stay consistent. Owu's cheapness didn't go away. Nope, I went on and uh, sprung for the monthly package that allows up to 100. So oh. this is why we're able to do this. So, hooray. Thanks, Owu. Like, it's even weirder. I haven't had a chance to actually watch The Daily Show yet, but apparently The Daily sh uh, Trevor Noah is, like, doing his show, doing The Daily Show from his couch. So. In, um, the well, NBC that's because he's central. Well, well, yeah, yeah. You know, you can't do that. But it's weird because in comparison to, like, uh, I think, what, James Corden and all the other late night shows, either they're not filming or they are filming and it's just them and, like, whatever the two, three producers are in the, in the uh, studio. If I recall correctly, uh, the Ellen DeGeneres show, she just, she was having, like, uh, guest hosts hosted in front of like just a uh, not a live audience but like with a uh, laugh a laughing reel laugh track yeah laugh track so after I watch if there's anything useful from the daily show the, he calls it the daily isolation or something if there's anything useful it may come up I wonder what other people are doing anyways so let's talk about some of the theories that underlie all of this experience so check the time, yeah. Uh, cultivation theory, all cultivation theory argues is that media constructs the narrative that uh, conveys underlying cultural values, ideologies, and social political perspectives. So cultivation theory argues that TV has a mainstreaming effect. It creates an overarching story or an overarching image. And so what the heck is mainstreaming? You can think of mainstreaming as normalizing. It's just the effect where TV portrayals of politics and culture overrides uh, people's diverse perspectives and experiences instead of accentuating them. So like saying, this is mainstream news. This is mainstream culture. Like the ways in which, I guess the best way to describe this would be like asking like your friends that are, uh, and are asking international students like what they think of when you say like American culture or what they thought would what they thought America would be like based on what they saw on TV. The ways in which uh, the ways in which international students or people from other countries describe America, those cliche things, or in particular like the red cups and things of that sort, it's the uh, imagery that they pick up from TV, and that. TV that they're getting all this information from is the mainstream TV. So like all mainstreaming does, it creates, it generalizes, it creates this generalizable picture and actually downplays the differences and the unique aspects that we all have as individuals. So I guess I can ask you all, 
now that we're on the inside, what is mainstream right now? What is, what is, how can we describe American media right now? What is mainstream media right now? I'm trying to see if there's a better way to. Uh, Perpetual flipping between Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. So we have extremely short attention spans and we are alternating between three sources of social media. What are we looking for when we're doing this, Max? Some sort of entertainment. <laughs> we are looking to be entertained. That's going to keep me. That is going to keep my attention. So we have social more than two seconds. For more than two seconds. Yeah, I mean, there's companies trying to capitalize on that right now. Like, um, that company that's using Chance the Rapper to advertise, like... What is it, Quibi or whatever? Yeah, Quibi. They're, like, really quick content. And it's like, you can get a free 30-day subscription. And I'm like, I don't even know what the hell I'm subscribing to. Like, <laughs> Sounds like TikTok. So, no, like, but it's, it's paid it's TikTok. TikTok. Well, look, yesterday I found out my little brother pays for YouTube Red, and I, like, I chewed him out. Because I was just like... Oh, yeah, it's such a ripoff. No, I think, Which is, like, I guess that means, like, before I uh, upload this on uh, YouTube, I'm going to have to edit, like, the last 10 seconds. Otherwise... They'll probably pull this video. <laughs> but uh yeah, I was just like, you pay ten dollars? Like, what is on there? And he's like, I just wanted it. So so you can put Zoom on YouTube? Interesting. So like because yeah, I can. And it's uh, not like the what? actual Zoom, it's like it's this, this lecture. Huh? What is YouTube bread? And basically, it's ad free, and you get like there's there's a, there's a pay, paywall where they uh, content creators can like create shows and stuff that they put up. It's it's really not worth it. It's like nine 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 a month, or basically no ads because the content they put out is usually trash. That, yeah, that's it sounds like shit. I mean, but I found out today Spectrum has been providing us with free epics in Showtime. Through like the end, like through mid April. So like I have to find out if there's anything worthwhile on Epics or Showtime. Epics does like a bunch of horror movies in the middle of the night that are interesting. If you like that'd be horror. It's like if it was like a horror series, I, I would do it. They're, they're all pretty funny too. Like they're all really bad horror movies. But then again, I found out uh, there's a there's a new anime that's coming out. Or well, not coming out. I just saw the commercials like Tokyo Fish Attack. It's like these weird sharks made it with spiders and now they have like spider legs and they're like going on land attacking people. So it's like Sharknado, but not weather. It's just like- I still don't get how you can watch all like nine of those movies. I watched the first movie and I didn't even make it through the whole thing. I watched the first one cause it was like two o'clock in the morning and I was like, I can't believe this is actually happening. But That's my point. All the bad horror movies are on like late at night on Netflix. But if it's like actual like killers and stuff, like, st like mm -mm. Like now, like we are like 30 seconds away from becoming the purge. Like, <laughs> I don't want anything like that. Like I read somewhere, apparently, yeah, in, in the Philippines, in Manila, the uh, mayor was like saying like, if there are any people that are breaking the curfew right now, like they can be shot and killed on site. Oh, at least ours is just a level two misdemeanor. So, and apparently to uh, start the curfew, they played like the announcement from the purge. So, like, they're, they're not playing in the Philippines. They're not playing at all. So. If you're looking for something to watch on Spectrum, though, uh, Spectrum On Demand has a lot of, like, really good movies for free. Do they now? Okay. Yeah. You should watch, uh, if you like comedy and Rebel Wilson, you should watch uh, The Hustle. It's free. It's hilarious. Oh, that's the what's it called? I know, I know what that is. I didn't so know that's already up there. Yeah. And the real answer is to be, Dr. You, Mac, you should finish if, grading those papers. If, <laughs> if you liked Sharknado, there's a cult classic on Prime Video called Velocipaster, and it is just as bad as Sharknado, but I don't know. It's interesting. 
Velocib Pastor. Pastor. It's a pastor that has like powers to turn into a Velociraptor and he goes around getting people. I don't know. I didn't make it to the whole movie. That's not that's like not the first good. fifteen minutes. That that sounds awful. Just it's pretty bad. So let's talk about the processes and effects of satire. So what am I what do I mean when I'm talking about satire? I'm talking about humor that's used to ridicule or expose human inconsistencies, usually in an effort to deconstruct notions of power and prestige. So I guess examples of satire. Well, you know, sometimes they do it on Saturday Night Live, even though they're more so parody than satire. I want to say A little bit of the Colbert Report was also satire, but they were also more so parody too. Um, what about the last week tonight with John Oliver? He does some satire. I've noticed like not a lot. It has a feel of satire to it. Actually, I wanted yeah that last yeah last week with John Oliver is actually closer to satire because they're not. Well, actually, yeah, John. Yeah, he's actually bringing. He's like reporting the news more so than actually like making fun of the news. Right. Which is more so than what uh what's it called it is doing, the Daily Show. The Daily Show makes fun of the news while informing us. Well wow. yeah. So yes, last week with John Oliver, that's satire. Uh so while it's cool and you know, yeah, you watch satire, you feel smarter because you're like, I don't watch the regular news. I can watch this instead. Watching satire, however, can uh, dim diminish motivation and ability to uh, form mental arguments with the satirist. Um, in order to engage in this high level and enjoy watching, you know, last week with John Oliver and enjoy watching uh, The Daily Show or even Full Frontal with Samantha B, all of these shows, you have to have some cognitive ability as well as political knowledge. So ever so often, there are people out there that like actually watch this and don't recognize that it's like actual, like it's not 150% news. There are like, I remember the first time I taught this class at OSU, there was an older person because, you know, we were, uh, they were allowed to have older people in the class that did not know that at the time, because I don't want to say Trevor Noah was still there. We, like we were just tr transitioning. They did not know that that was actually not a regular news show. And I was just like, how do you, this is not like, this is an entertainment show that's somewhat educational, but like they didn't know that. And I was like, wow. Uh, anyways, uh, however, watching a satire can improve and actually solidify uh, cynical political beliefs. You know, like after a while, you watch enough satire, like you watch all that stuff, you become jaded. Like, because all those shows show and highlight is just like the inefficiencies and the problems that exist within uh, American politics in particular. So like eventually, like even now, like I just saw the commercial for The Daily Show and he's like cracking jokes about uh, how bad the social distancing is in New York, apparently. Even though I heard like it's really bad that uh, the mayor has cut off or not the mayor, I think it's, is it the mayor? It's not the governor, but they cut off like a whole set of subway trains to New York City. And so it, it's causing like all the trains to be overrun. And so they're uh, not able to actually practice uh, safe social distancing. And so you see people like trying really hard to maintain like the six feet or they're like hiding their faces and they're doing all these weird movements. But anyways, I say all that to say like in the commercial, Trevor Noah's like cracking jokes at like the struggles that people are having, which of course is promoting cynicism wasn't it just i don't know the days are running together but i think oh, yeah in 111 my students and i were talking at length about how weird it is watching uh the press conferences with the president and how they're still on stage they're not even practicing the six feet and like how weird that is speaking of which did you see the press conference where um I don't remember her name, but she's at the podium and she said she wasn't there because she was sick and she had a fever and then Trump just says nope, turns around and leaves. Is this, right next to her? Is this the woman with the lovely scarves? Because I love her scarf game. I think so, I don't remember. But she, she says, are you doing this? I wasn't here on Saturday. I had a low, I had a low grade fever. And he just goes, nope, turns around and leaves. End of press conference. 
You know what? I, I have to look for that on YouTube because like in that moment, oh, I wish I would have seen that because I think I would have clapped and been like, that's my president. I would have done the same thing. Like, oh, you had a fever? We're done. Oh, We're done. That was great. I made me laugh. <laughs> so, uh, but also engaging in satire can increase political knowledge. Uh, it can also increase political efficacy, which, of course, is belief that the government will ultimately respond to you. And then, of course, efficacy in turn will increase political res- uh, participation. So efficacy is the belief that the government will do what you want in response. Yes. So what does this mean as it leads to polling data? So of course we know polls, all that's not all that stuff. They're just surveys, questionnaires done by the media, politicians, political interest groups, researchers like myself, because we want to know what the public thinks about X, Y, and Z. Cool stuff. Want to learn more about public opinion? I'm teaching it again in 2021. Maybe we'll see. Polls uh, can provide accurate information and provide mechanisms through which citizens can provide feedback to leaders, to groups, but these polls can be flawed. We try to focus on voters, but that is extremely difficult to estimate. Uh, There's social desirability that can influence uh, what people say. It's social desirability is you want to be liked because all people want to be liked. And so if someone asks you, do you know anything about quantum physics? You're like, "Mm -hmm, mm mm-hmm, 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 especially if you're over the phone. And you give any sort of answer, any sort of answer you want. And so when we researchers would ask questions about what are your thoughts on reproductive rights? Or yesterday I was asking my students, had they heard like there's a movement uh, apparently within the LGBTQ community, well, LGB, L, yeah, LGB and Q movement to actually have the T removed from LGBTQ because they argue that uh, transsexual and tra- yeah, trans not transsexual, transgender is a gender identity and not a sexual orientation. And as such, it should be removed. And all of my students were just sitting here nodding their heads. And I was like, y'all haven't heard this before. I pulled this out of the cesspools of Reddit. Like, unless you all are now hanging out in the cesspools of Reddit, you don't know. There's only like five people in that whole thread. And I was like three o'clock in the morning and I should have gone to bed. But they were like nodding their heads. And I was like, Y'all just want to look cool. But that's an example of social desirability. It's like, yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, that sounds like that makes sense. Or if you hear people being asked, well, what are your thoughts on immigration reform? Or actually what's going on or what some people argue happens on campus, uh, closeted Republicans, closeted conservatives say, well, you know, they have to stay in the closet because it's expected. It's the... uh, it's expected on campus for you all that you have to be Democrats or liberal leaning because, you know, if you're not, oh, and there's like judgment and all that stuff. But, you know, now we're home, you know, you're home now. Well, you know, Dr. Mac never cared. But, uh, yeah, but that's one problem. And then another problem, non-response. So, like, people just don't take the surveys. That's really hard. <clears throat> Even after we promised to like give away money for Chipotle, people still won't take it. I guess there's like still three people who never got their uh, Chipotle gift cards. I feel like at this point now I can just keep them. But who knows? Maybe not. Maybe I can like save them and maybe magically raffle them off for the final exam. I don't know. We'll see. But that's also a problem. So let's see, it is 3.51. We can pause here, finish that little bit up on, yeah, actually we can save that for uh, Tuesday and then use this to slide into media and campaign effects, which I'm like excited about talking about campaigns. I'm going to dig up some of the most uh, noteworthy as well as uh, controversial political ads ran by, not politicians, ran by presidents from past elections. It's going to be fun. All the media. Did anybody have any questions or anything? No. Nope. Can you give a quick run of what's going on with the um, Twitter posts? 
Uh, the quick run through for the Twitter post. So I am going through and uploading. Well, not uploading. So the ones that are most recent, putting them back up on Twitter. And I'm going through and reading them, making sure that they meet the minimum requirements, make sure that they're not. Today, I woke up and decided to watch C-SPAN. It was interesting. I learned a lot about the coronavirus. Those kinds are not like we're not doing that. No, I'm not looking for. Okay, now. Huh? What, what about, about like, like late posts and stuff? The so, if you let's say you signed up for February 24th, and now you decided to uh, submit it now under February 24th, no. So, like, if I go through for February 24th and I see one that was submitted yesterday, that's not going to count. I instead, if you did not do it the date you were supposed to, go pick up one of these current dates or tomorrow or a future date and put it in there. All the dates that I want to see for the, you know, okay. all the submissions that I want to see for those dates should be by that date or before. So if you missed the date, okay. find a future date. All that I want is so that by the end of the semester, you have met your quota and they were all timely submissions. So no late ones. Okay. No lates. No lates. So I found out, I did some research and the video that was about Trump was a little bit doctor. He doesn't actually leave, but it's just a joke. So I found it. A joke? <laughs> here, 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 in the chat, watch it. It's like 30 seconds. <laughs> 